thank you very much that you are uh, giving me the honor to listen to that. A very quick preview. Um, this is about um, the ergonomics of a human organism, which is basically the idea of anatomy and physiology in function, performing the activity of living. So, uh, brain injuries, of course, are functional processes, and I would like to go to the really tangible, logical, natural science aspects of it, basically physics tonight. I believe it's very, very helpful if we do understand the non-negotiable mandatory aspect of brain injury. Let's right start into it. So, brain injury and neurofeedback is the basic topic, and the goal of the presentation is that we understand the physics of brain injury, the physical, tangible um, background of it, that we understand the consequences this has for the functioning of a human organism, and based on the two, provide a um, type of assistance which is most promising to actually be beneficial for the client. So the content of the presentation, we look at the physics of the human central nervous system first. Um, mind you, that is only partly anatomy. Second, we look at the most uh, fundamental types of causes of brain injury. Then we ask the question, is brain injury diagnosable? An interesting question. And we look at the functional consequences brain injury has on the anatomy and physiology of a human being. Then we look at a couple of uh, requirements to recover from brain injury. And uh, finally, I hope we get there within this hour, um, we discuss, this is an open discussion, the most um, beneficial means and ways to actually address the issue. So let's go to it. The physics of the human central nervous system. Let's start um, what we know from observation out there in the literature. The brain is an integral part of the central nervous system. Keep that always in mind. So if we talk brain here, we talk central nervous system. It consists of the brain and the brainstem medulla, plus the rest of the spinal cord, which functionally form a unit. Unfortunately, the brainstem and the spinal cord, or let's say the, the, the central nervous part of it, is almost inaccessible with the means we have today to observe. So um, EEG neuroscience looks exclusively at the brain, not so much for uh, any specific reason other than it's just convenient because accessible. Keep in mind, there is much more to it than just the brain. So let's have a closer look at the uh, central nervous system. We know that it consists of roughly 150 billion individual neurons, if you count the ones in the brainstem and the spinal cord as well. Um, all of these neurons are floating in liquid. And now this is a very important point to remember. They do not touch each other anywhere. Each, individual, each neuron is floating individual. They are nowhere physically suspended. And um, the neurons only connect with each other in form of communication via the synaptic pairs. This is very important to remember to understand what brain injury actually is. The synaptic pairs, that's where two neurons get close together but don't touch is where it all happens. It's a pair of senders, receivers, exchanging communication, very much so um, as a pair of speakers or microphones would do. The communication location, I have to move something on my screen here, okay. Uh, the communication location is the synapses, no other part. Now, synapsis requires extreme proximity, but must never touch. So again, neurons float freely, individually, in liquid. What does that mean? The question which arises now, what holds these two pairs aligned in place? They don't touch, there is no suspension, 
So how can the central nervous system counteract gravity? How can it prevent all these uh, 90, million, uh, 90 billion neurons to, to gradually drift down to the bottom of the skull? Or, uh, in the other way, float up to the surface? How could the central nervous system physically counter up uh, any inertia of motion? The physics of counteracting gravity are very simple. There are two ways which um, allow this on this planet. One way is a mechanical support or a suspension, and the other way would be buoyancy or floating. Obviously, by observation, we know there is no mechanical support. There is no sub uh, suspension. No neuron is attached to anything. So the obvious way nature has solved the problem to counteract gravity in order to allow a central nervous system is buoyancy and floating. Now, buoyancy has a couple of um, uh, quite important challenges to overcome. In order to keep a neuron and ultimately the tens of thousands of synaptic pairs it forms with other neurons at place, is it requires an absolute equilibrium of specific weights. The liquid suspending the neurons up there in our head needs to be exactly balanced to the weight of the neuron or else it starts either floating down or floating up and the synaptic clefts are separated. Another very severe challenge is that if a neuron is sus uh, suspended by liquid, it is also subjected to hydrodynamics. Now, hydrodynamics is the laws of physics which make liquids act, float in a, in a certain way. This is very important to understand if you want to understand where brain injury actually happens. The greatest physical challenge of any central nervous system out there is the liquid because liquid moved cause, causes turbulence and turbulence washes the synaptic clefts apart. If that happens, the entire system of the central nervous is interrupted because it functions only by neurons communicated with a single neuron is of no use. So how does uh, nature, what physical possibilities do there exist to actually avoid turbulence in a moving liquid? The question is very simple. It's the bottle principle. A solid container. The solid container absorbs physical forces. You can test this out with a Coke bottle filled to the top and you can shake it sideways, nothing happens. You can also drop a, a drop of ink into a bottle, fill it with water, drop of ink inside and shake it. The ink doesn't disperse. So the bottle principle is the only way where it, which makes it physical possible, a solid container, to absorb the physical forces of motion within the central nervous system and allows motion of the entire system, the human organism, without disrupting uh, synaptic um, connections. That's how the human bottle principle looks. Generally, the skull is fundamentally misunderstood. The skull does not primarily protect against outside forces but the skull must at all times, every slight motion you do with your organism against inside happenings. It is a mand mandatory, absolutely mandatory component of the central nervous system. Without the skull, the liquid would spill and disrupt synaptic um, uh, connections. It's physically necessary to have a bottle around the central nervous system, else it couldn't function. The skull is absolutely required to allow a human being any type of motion. Without it, the central nervous system would fall apart. 
The skull is, uh, and together of course with the spinal bones, the vertebrae, allows at all the existence of synaptic pairs, and it's all physics. However, relatively, the skull uh, pro uh, prevents or pre provides very lousy blow protection. It isn't statically very well uh, designed. Its primary uh, purpose is indeed to keep the liquid which floats the 90 billion neurons inside the head stable enough to allow motion. On the other hand, our human bot bottle is 100% recyclable. The physics to avoid turbulence with the physical principle of a bottle works extremely well with homogeneous content. It works with inc uh, incompressible content. However, it only works very limited with a human brain. And the reason is again very physical, the anatomy of the brain. The brain is anything but homogeneous and the brain contains a lot of compressible parts. In other words, the brain has very different specific weights at different locations. And it is, um, there is a, an, an enormous system of ventricles containing different type of liquids within the brain. What does that do? It reduces dramatically the protective effect of a bottle when a human brain is moved at all. Any sudden motion whatsoever causes internal turbulence, which must, that it's non-negotiable, wash synapses apart. It may, under extreme cases, also tangle or twist neurons or even break them. All this is not up to, uh, does not only happen when we think about it, it's non-negotiable primary laws of nature. So let's look at the causes of brain injury. We have two fundamental causes. Physical forces, as we have already touched them right now, um, is one of the uh, fundamental causes. Another fundamental cause of brain injury is biochemical environmental causes. The physical causes, they wash, uh, wash synapses apart. If the forces are more severe, they may even tangle or twist neurons. And if they are extreme, they might physically destroy neurons. However, whether uh, the, the, the neurons are destroyed or tangled or twisted, the, the problem is they do not function in the network anymore. Hence, they are no longer available for the uh, functionality of the brain. The biochemical environmental causes can be multifold. First of all, the environment for every neuron is not what happens out there. It couldn't care less. The environment of a neuron is the buoyancy fluid and nothing else. One of the causes which can cause neurons to become dysfunctional is, of course, supply shortage. If anything happens uh, which reduces the amount of necessary supply in the buoyancy frequency, which is not the blood, which is separated from the blood by the blood-brain barrier, if there is a shortage there, of course, the neuron becomes less functional, hence less functional for the system. Another uh, environmental um, condition which might reduce neuronal functioning is of course toxic hazards, heavy metals, we have named them all, and causing ultimately what is not so very well described scientifically but very common in use, inflammation, oxidative stress and so on, all reduce the functionality, hence synaptic pairs become dysfunctional. No matter what the cause is, either physical through turbulence or um, environmental, biochemically, it doesn't matter. All these causes are absolutely non-negotiable. There is nothing we can do. We cannot get around. If the conditions aren't there, the neurons can't function. And all these conditions are at all times cumulative. 
So you can have a physical turbulence caused uh, washed apart synapsis situation and toxic ha ha hazard and supply um, um, difficulties, which of course are cumulative, means it increases the effect. Now what is brain injury? It is a very simple thing. Some neurons are out of service. That's it. The reason isn't all that important. The question is, is brain injury diagnosable? Can we find out whether this has happened? We have two types of primary diagnostic high-tech tools available at this moment. One is uh, uh, the group of fMRI technology and the other one is um, EEG technology. Let's look at the diagnostic tool fMRI. <clears throat> this is a picture I just downloaded from the internet and look at the title. It says, Cortical Activity During Hand Movement. Well, cortical? There is nothing cortical which an fMRI can possibly discover. It is cardiovascular. fMRIs can only discover blood profusion. They cannot discover what happens to individual neurons. Unfortunately, there, uh, there, there are uh, nowadays a lot of assumptions taken and it's, ve it's a very common idea out there that brain injury is local. And it's sort of like a bump uh, at the front because the thing splashes forward and the damage is up front or back there. Uh, it's cool, counter cool theory. This is all based on fMRI observations, which cannot observe the brain, but actually measure blood profusion in tissues, swelling, and the brain itself cannot swell. So, it is physically impossible that brain injuries can be local. Keep in mind, neurons float in liquid. Neurons don't touch. touch. Neurons require synaptic pairs in place. The physical laws do not allow an injury up front to happen without causing damage in the rest of the central nervous system. First of all, there isn't any vacuum possible which would allow the brain as a whole to move forward. Any type of physical force applied to the head causes expansion and compression locally within the brain which is only possible with liquid floating, tearing neurons apart. In other words, any time or a type of brain injury always affects the entire brain somehow, somewhere, to some degree. And there is always turbulence throughout the entire brain. This causes physical loss, it's non-negotiable, diffuse, disconnected synapses all over the brain. In other words, the fMRI, uh, fMRI, which looks at blood profusion, cannot anywhere get close um, dislocated synapses. How about the other di diagnostic tool, the QEEG? Well, we know that it, it drives at least 60 million neurons firing simultaneously to produce a detectable signal at the um, surface of the skull. Um, not very likely that we can actually locate any um, area even which is uh, affected by uh, dislocated synapses or dysfunctional synapses by means of EEG. However, brain injury physically must reduce brain power. Less neurons online cannot produce the same amount of electrical activity as we could if we have all neurons functioning. So uh, the diagnostic tool, not really, but at least the QEG gives us some indication. The indication is reduced brain power, as you can see here on this, my favorite midline again. I'm sure Richard and uh, Rob are chuckling in the background. <laughs> but um, it is indeed a physically logical, clear indicator, an indicator, not a diagnose of some type of brain injury if we have a reduced brain power. 
what causes that injury is not discernible. It could be uh, a starvation, a lack of resources, it could be a biochemical uh, environmental situation and it could be physical. Just simply uh, synapses was washed apart by turbulence or a combination of all that. But at least with the EEG we do have some hint that there might be brain injury and it would look something like that. This is the, uh, the midline of a relative of mine who had a car accident some 20 years ago and um, it's two years old, that midline. But you can see uh, the colorful columns all together are not actually matching up the gray ones. Low brain power overall. Another indication the, the, the EEG can give us is, um, of course, uh, functionally increased interconnectivity. Why is that so? If there is an area in your brain where the, um, uh, the, the synaptic connections don't work, whether the neuron is out of service or the synapse is washed apart, doesn't matter, other parts of the brain tend, must tend to take over the functionality. So there will be enlarged, increased network activities necessary where one part of the brain takes over, plays the music of another. And that would reflect in the QEEG in an increased functionality or in, um, interconnectivity. So, of course, uh, the QEEG also does not really qualify to diagnose a um, uh, brain injury what, uh, caused by whatever, however, it gives generally probably the better indications than an fMRI to suspect a brain injury. The problem is brain injury is not quantifiable, it's not diagnosable. However, it is subject to the laws of physics and it can very, very reliably be conclusive. Concluded from what? Very simple, client history. Considering this, it's just once more obvious how important it is to know something about the life of a client. The reason is very simple and it's the actual tragedy of any brain injury. An injured brain doesn't hurt. The injury is completely invisible. Nobody ever has a question if somebody breaks a leg and has, uh, has it all plastered up and walks with crutches whether this person is reduced in activity and the person itself does a slightly wrong movement and sees the stars from pain. pain. However, a brain injured person itself or themselves cannot notice that they are brain injured and that's the big tragedy of brain injury. We will see why in a second. For other people, whether it be us, the, uh, the, the people trying to assist a brain injured person, or, or most significantly those around the injured, do never ever have any clue that that person is actually brain injured. And this is the primary cause of, Rob, you might listen carefully now, the sleep issues which come along with a brain injury. But we come to that a little bit later. So again, brain injury can reliably be concluded from client history. As a rule of the thumb, if someone has experienced a external force, a movement, a motion of the head, produced by an external force, not by the muscles of that person themselves, it most likely causes brain injury to a certain degree. The human brain is extremely vulnerable and part of it is upright walking. But that's a different story, maybe I'll present about the, uh, the challenges in uh, some other time. For now, let's look at what this brain, uh, the functional causes this brain injury has in any case. Let's recall brain injury just means some neurons are out of service. Now what are the physical consequences of this fact? 
keep in mind every neuron is in contact according to uh, research uh, every neuron is in contact with all uh, with every other neuron over only maximum three other neurons if we translate this one single neuron taken out of service potentially affects 10 billion network patterns it is absolutely amazing how much damage a single neuron out of um, order theoretically could cause of course networks need to be able to cope with that which means they do not become dysfunctional if one single neuron is out of service however what they do become is less precise and they might become slower so whatever the degree of a brain injury what it must cause is the data processing capacity of the brain is physically reduced networks become fractured reduced which must physically reduce the processing speed and it must reduce the precision of data processing in other words it simply slows the entire organism down in all its function including digestion whatsoever now the question is how does the CNS react to the injury and we have to keep in mind something which is very often forgotten particularly by uh, uh, neuroscientists and neurologists the human organism is a self maintaining self organizing unit in other words your ancestors couldn't have possibly survived if the brain wasn't capable of assessing its own damage so the brain is if there is anything or let's put it that way uh, we confuse non-conscious processes with automatic processes very easily there is absolutely never anything automatic about what the brain does or else a human organism couldn't exist it requires decision-making it, it, it requires constant assessment of the physical state of the physiological state of the organism and it requires corresponding directive actions to the entire organism and that's the job of the brain so when a brain injury occurs the first thing a brain does it must assess the damage under extreme cases this can cause the brain to have to withdraw attention to the, the environment of the organism which would appear the person to be comatose or lose consciousness but it doesn't necessarily have to happen even with a uh, sincere uh, brain damage that's why um, <clears throat> the Glasgow index is better than nothing but it's not more than that it does not it, not being non-conscious does not mean you have not suffered from a severe brain damage but go back to the functional um, consequences of brain damage the first step the brain must do to keep your life is it has to assess the damage then in a second step it has to assess the remaining resources and instantly start to keep you alive with what is left in function the thing the brain must do under all circumstances it, it has to increase the vigilance because its own processing speed is reduced it also has to it, it must be able it must be more on the lookout in order to be able to react in time with a reduced reaction speed it also has to reduce stress tolerance for the same reason and it has to increase by all means by all possible means repair activity in order to restore itself and the rest of the organism which might be have been damaged through the event which caused the brain injury so now the question is how does the injured perceive the brain's directions again the directions are increased vigilance reduced stress tolerance and increased repair activity there are three emotional motivational patterns 
which in a long, after a long chain of consecutive um, events will actually lead to behavior which might be diagnosed by someone else. Increased vigilance would probably be perceived by uh, increased anxiety, increased worries, increased rumination patterns, a general over-arousal of the organism, which is measurable also by EEG, and an increased performance pressure. In other words, uh, social patterns become more impacting and so on. Social competence might be reduced because the increased vigilance causes overreaction. The reduced stress tolerance has another pattern of um, diagnosable behavioral or emotional situations, it must increase irritability and anger. It increases the amount of panic attacks which can happen. And it, of course, increases patterns of active and passive aggression, etc. Keep in mind, all these are physical necessities, healthy reaction of an injured organism. The increased repair activity is by far the most frequent uh, consequence of known cases of brain um, damage statistically. It comes along with dizziness, fatigue, headaches, difficulties to focus, depression, etc. All these are motivational drives to actually shut out interaction with the environment and instead use the resources to repair what's damaged. The human organism, like everything else out there, has only so and so much resources and it's often time either or. Either you're accurate and focused or you do repair. So the indication that statistically the most common uh, in particularly also with light head injuries, the most common symptoms, if you want to call them, they are not symptoms, they are guided, um, guided motivations created by the brain, are dizziness, fatigue, headaches, difficulties to focus, depression, etc. Um, uh, a kind of a heretic remark, if you find anything here, it's probably caused by head, uh, head injury and it is a healthy, normal, reactive response of a functional organism. What is required to recover from brain injury? Well, the recovery process is strikingly simple. Neurons are out of service, the brain needs to rebuild synaptic pairs and it can do that. The process is a very common process out there in nature. It's a chemical affinity thing, where one neuron starts to send out a um, chemical signal into the, the, the supportive liquid around it. Another neuron receives it and is triggered to actually build a sort of an expansion in the direction where the liquid comes from and uh, gradually moves itself into position. While it does so, it also um, um, uh, produces a transmitter which tells the original cell that the growing process from one side is in place. It's a very similar, similar appearance as that which makes a sperm cell find an egg to fertilize. It's a biochemical affinity process. However, it's extremely slow. And this is the main, main reason why brain recovery actually takes so much time. It's an extremely slow process and if you consider that one single neuron that has to be replaced builds up to 10,000 synaptic connections with others until it becomes completely functional in the network again, we can imagine how much growing effort on an extremely small scale is actually required to repair. But it's a normal process and it always happens if the injured allows it to happen. 
And that's the biggest problem with an affluent uh, domesticated lifestyle. If the injury is so severe that uh, uh, individual neurons are actually broken, they have to be first replaced, of course. Uh, we know there is, there is quite um, conclusive research here that the brain continuously produces stem cells and they are transported into place. And once they are there, the synaptic connection building process starts again. We call that neurogenesis. The first part, bringing neurons in place, is called neurogenesis, creation of new neurons. However, having them there doesn't, happen, does, uh, doesn't help anything. They need to connect and reconnect with the network. So um, this requires a use of the newly, freshly um, uh, built synaptic connections and that happens best by simply using those connections. This is neuroplasticity. Of course, in order to allow the brain uh, to uh, recover from a brain injury, there are a couple of very specific behavioral conditions which must be met by the entire organism. First of all, uh, the, uh, the organism must, must go out there and collect the right building materials so that the brain actually does have the, uh, the bricks to build new neurons and new connections. This is done by a uh, specific nutrition. Keep in mind, so, swallowing nutrition doesn't bring it into the environment of the neurons. neurons. An, in, an enormous amount of processing, transporting, and uh, uh, reshaping has to take place within the organism before the building material is actually available in the direct environment of, of the neuron, the cerebrospinal fluid. Another thing which is absolutely required for uh, brain healing is a maximum reduction of global stress when awake. This is required because the brain healing requires an enormous amount of energy and, and resources. And if these resources are used up by physical hyperactivity or mental hyperactivity, they're not, simply not available to do, for, for brain healing. Then, of course, the affected organism must allow itself extra time, more than would be required to just maintain the healthy body, to do the repair job. And brain repair can only, physiologically and physically, can only happen during sleep. And finally, what is also required uh, to, to heal someone's brain is the right entrainment to get the right type of neuroplasticity. Brains are the primary function of uh, brains are to uh, coordinate movement, motion which, of course, includes also things like speaking and so on. So, uh, to, in training motor uh, functions is the most, is probably the most, there is a lot of uh, experiments done with um, uh, relative mammals, which uh, strongly support that fact, that the right type of physical activity is strongly supporting uh, quick recovery of uh, broken um, synaptic pairs. Right type does not mean go to the gym. That is definitely not the right type. It's more about um, training fine motor skills, writing, playing a, a, a musical instrument, uh, typing, um, leisure walking, swimming is an extremely, extremely beneficial uh, type of um, physical activity. Jogging isn't anything which is powerful, eats up resources and that has to, they're no longer available for brain healing. So uh, it isn't quite obvious, any t it's not any type of motion which supports brain healing. There are a lot of types of physical activity which actually are contradictory. Now, lastly, before we come, oh, I hope we still have a minute or so for questions, but there is this 
myth out there that brain injuries cause sleep issues. The myth is understandable because many people who suffer from brain injury, actually stat uh, statistically the, the huge majority actually also suffers from sleep issues. However, if brain injuries would cause sleep issues, we would not have any ancestors and would not exist. It's, it's functionally impossible. Brain healing requires extra sleep. And a brain injury would be an instant death sentence if the brain injury itself could possibly cause um, uh, sleep issues. Obviously, there are sleep issues connected with brain injury. So, what causes them? Keep in mind, the brain indicates every brain injured its need for extra rest with dizziness, fatigues, headaches, difficulties to focus, depression, and so all motivators which would naturally cause a person to shut off, lie down, and do some brain healing. However, modern lifestyle um, has a completely, and that's, that's now really a cultural and density issue, a domestication issue, it actually increases perceived social inaccuracy. We are under an enormous social performance stress. The brain injured becomes slow and does not know the cause of the slowness because the brain injury doesn't, doesn't, doesn't um, hurt. What the, the injured perceives is things uh, become a little bit harder to perform. And the normal reaction to do that is try harder, which further depletes the system of resources, further requires an increased arousal, and this is what ultimately brings the, uh, the, the injured person into an extreme arousal state. Plus, the fact that the injury isn't visible causes misunderstandings between the injured and its social environment. People don't understand why that person starts to overact so much, is so oversensitive, so emotional. And this causes additional so social stress, all driving up the over-arousal spiral to a maximum. So, the actual cause of the sleep issues is the increased vigilance, anxieties, worries, rumination patterns, over-arousal, increased performance pressure, and the reduced stress tolerance, plus the social reaction on these um, increased over-arousal states. How does that affect sleep? Here, just it's, uh, keep in mind, this is a sleep hypnogram. It's uh, some of, one of the official things out there. That's, why, that's how neuroscience believes sleep happens. But it demonstrates, uh, we can demonstrate a little bit how this, uh, uh, brain, what happens to a brain injured person with respect to sleep. So a healthy sleep pattern, according to those people who do sleep studies in sleep labs, which aren't very reliable, is sleep cycles which never really touch the awake boundary. The sleep work, the active sleep work is done in this blue range here. So a healthy person enters sleep with a, let's call it normal, arousal state and goes actually through these maintenance cycles one after the other uh, in a pretty highly efficient way without normally waking up. So, if you enter sleep at this arousal level here, then there is the highest possible outcome out of the time you spend doing sleep work. However, if you're brain injured, the arousal level where you enter sleep for the reasons we have just mentioned, the increased vigilance and the reduced stress tolerance and its consequences throughout the awake date, the uh, uh, brain injured person actually arrives at the start sleep point with an extreme arousal state. And a little bit simplified, but it demonstrates what actually happens. Still, you have the circadian rhythms of sleep, only it, they only dip into the productive sleep work range partly. And 
the brain injured or the over aroused it's the same uh, the same cause of um, sleep issues as non brain injured over aroused people face is simply that the depth of the sleep cycle isn't sufficient or the depth of the relaxation, physiological relaxation of the organism isn't deep enough to actually allow the person to go into a full sleep period where all sleep work can be perceived. And the person has difficulties falling asleep, wakes up in between, has more and more difficulties to fall asleep again, just drowses off instead of being in a productive sleep state. That explains why um, this physiologically or functionally completely um, uh, impossible situation that an injury would cause sleep issues can happen. But the reason for that is simply that our modern lifestyle does not allow a, re a natural reaction on brain injury. If you're living on a, on a sandy beach like the one on my desktop, right? If you live there and all you need to do to keep yourself alive is occasionally get up from the sand, walk five steps behind you and grab a ripe banana. If you need to have an existence depending on a complex, anonymous human social structure by performing after certain expectations, then, of course, this stress, per persistent stress here, becomes devastating. This guy, who isn't brain injured, or less to a lesser degree than that one, would have the much greater capacity to heal his brain injury, of course, than this one, who needs it more. So, that is the reason why we now can look at how can we, sub once we have, by logical conclusion, determined that there must be a brain injury to a certain degree. How can we support it best? Also, by using uh, the tool of neurofeedback. First of all, we need to make sure that that person does have the building materials. In other words, we need to look at that person's nutrition. Without the building materials, there is no way the brain can heal, not because he couldn't do it, but because the material is missing. Keep in mind, so, swallowing nutri uh, nutritionals does not in any way cure a brain. The organism needs to digest those nutritionals, take them apart, rebuild them, and transport them into the area where it's needed. For instance, the supportive uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So, nutrition alone is definitely no cure for brain injury. Contrary, if you have severe digestive problems like a, glu a completely glued up intestinal surface by gluten, then those no nutritionals are pretty much wasted. Having swallowed them doesn't bring them to where they are needed. The most important, by far the most important um, uh, component of healing brain injury is to help your client accept the injury and become aware of it every moment of active life. Physical stress relief, mental stress relief are absolutely mandatory non-negotiable conditions to allow time and resources for the brain to, he to, uh, to, uh, to heal. There is no injury where it is possibly even more important to focus on sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene includes physical and mental stress relief, but many other factors too. And there is no way around if you don't allow a, a brain injured person additional, more than normal, and normal means anatomically normal, not what we are used to, uh, sleep, there is simply not enough capacity for the brain to actually heal itself, even so it could do that at any time, if it's allowed to. And finally, the right type of physical activity. So, this is the physical background and basically concludes the presentation. Here is my logical conclusion, what I suggest to do with neurofeedback. As soon as there is any clue for brain injury is focus on calming the system down. Do not focus on 
um, behavioral symptoms like anxiety or um, uh, uh, panic attacks or anything. Calm the system down. Very globally, very squashy, very generally. Assist the client. Be a real doctor. The Latin word doctor does not mean, does not describe a person who goes about fixing others, repairing others. The Latin word doctor means teacher, educator. And that's required when it comes to brain injury for a very simple reason. There isn't anybody out there on the planet who could possibly put someone else's synaptic, uh, synaptic pairs back into position or make them functional. This is a job only the injured him or herself could possibly do. But they can do it provided they know how. And this know-how is what is absolutely missing at this point. As supportive assistance to a, uh, any healing process with the means of neurofeedback as a tool, we can educate our clients to heal their brains. But you, as a clinician, cannot do it for the client. Okay, so um, that concludes actually my presentation. And uh, if, if I still do have an audience, I'm now open for questions. Uh, Martin, this is Rob. Uh, a while back, and I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, Dr. Harris um, noted, or she said, what the, you made a comment about the fon fontanelles uh, don't fill the bottle principle. She said, doesn't make sense with kids. And uh, Elizabeth, if you can maybe rephrase that, because I'm not yeah. doing very well with it, but maybe if you got the question, and, and uh, Martin, that's it. Doesn't make sense. Kids with fontanelles don't fill the bottle principle. So that's all I can, she wrote that to me. Okay, fontanelles. Um, I, uh, could you explain a little bit more uh, uh, what the term means? I might not be, uh, uh, might not cap, uh, cap, capture it. Uh, I understand cavities, extra cavities, right? I don't know, it's not my question. Uh, Dr. Is, uh, Harris, if you can, uh, if, you, if you're online with us still and you can speak, it'd be good to have you kind of ask this question because I'm, I'm uh, not doing a great job here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but uh, I see she's here, but I don't hear her yeah. speak. Uh, is she, uh, Richard, is she unmuted? I'm looking to see. Is it with Harris? Oh, she says she she just wrote me. She has no audio, so she's... Oh, uh, okay. So, Dr. <laughs> Harris, um, you can hear us at least. Email Martin your question directly because uh, I'm not doing a good job. You just wrote a, you know a sentence and I was reading it word for word and we're not quite uh, quite making sense of it here. So I'll let somebody else ask questions then. By the way, uh, this is Rick. Uh, oh, you have Martin just to clarify. So the fontanelles, the font, the fontanelles are the soft parts of the skull. Be, where the skull is not uh, uh, complete in children. Oh, you know, oh, the yeah, skull right. has to, right. has yeah. to uh, uh, ossify. Yeah, but that happens with... So those are the fontanelles. You know what I'm talking about now? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, the, the zigzag, uh, they, they form the zigzag lines across the skull once they're um, um, fortified, right? And they need to be open in order to pass through the birth channel. Keep in mind, it is... Right, it's, so it's, yes. It's so, yeah. uh, of course, of course the, the principle, the, prop, the bottle principle is there nevertheless. It's just an extreme weak point in the evolution of a human being. The birth, birth. But we know that in other factors too. And once, the problem is also the, the skull of course still has to grow. However, the bottle bread, and that's why uh, uh, the, the phase in life when uh, an infant starts to do its first walking attempts is the most likely cause of severe brain damage. That's the point where a still weakened and a partly not completely bottled 
a skull hits the ground or hits 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 uh, hits the leg of a chair or uh, whatsoever that causes severe damage however the brain is in that phase still in that um, uh, process of growing which will last another let's say 24 years so it has the highest possible recovery potential if the, if the situation doesn't persist, which it would, for instance, in a shaken baby or or uh, or child abuse situation. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, I uh, uh, yes. Did you? Yeah. Go ahead. I think that was just a yes. The juvenile brain is sometimes very susceptible to an exaggerated response too. So there's a juvenile traumatic brain syndrome where where a young brain actually uh, uh, can uh, create uh, more inflammation than normal. Yeah. So it works both ways. Yeah, uh, it's, it's 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 you know this this this. Anyway. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Anyway, that's not my question. I have another question. The main, the main issue with traumatic brain injury now seems to be whether or not somebody should rest. You want, you want to calm the system down, or they should go back to work and study and do all of those things. So should they be active, or they should be rest? Now, based on what you know about traumatic brain injury, what is your recommendation? Oh, there is should the brain just rest? There's absolutely no question about that, Rick. And it's, it's, it's a very simple question of resource management. Okay, so uh, there is no. So the worst thing somebody can do is go back and pretend to be no to, to be healthy. That is really accurate. Yeah, but there is a. But there, you're right. You seem to make it simple, but there really is a lot of controversy about it because there's a quite a bit of evidence now that people do better if they actually stay more active. Uh, Rick, the thing is, uh, it is damaging to lie on the sofa 24 hours and not move. The reason is uh, the reason why oh, we I see your point. I see your point. Yeah, the reason why we functionally don't have a brain, uh, do need to have a brain. Uh, every mobile creature on this planet must have a central nervous system, and the reason why this is because functionally the organism needs to be coordinated. So if you want to induce um, neuroplasticity, you need to use that coordination capacity of the brain. The more you use it, the better it goes. However, the issue with brain injury is if you use the organism in a way which costs resources, which consumes resources, these resources are not available for the brain healing. See? So that's why, yes, being physically active leisurely is beneficial. You have you have seen that with the rat study. Ra you have demonstrated this very very nicely with the rat study, Rick. Certain types of activities, yes, which relieve the the the, the relieve physical load on the central nervous system and increase its um, electro uh, bioelectronical load is the, is in fact promoting uh, the growth of new. Uh, the, um, synaptic connections, while anything which is causing stress on the organism is directly through uh, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and so on, inhibiting the healing process. See, it's inhibiting digestion, and it inhibits the healing process. Apart from the fact that it consumes an enormous amount of resources in terms of fuel and oxygen, which isn't available for the healing process and it increases arousal. So going back to work, which is usually a source of enormous social and performance stress, is definitely not something I would recommend. However, I would also not recommend to lie on the sofa um, inactive. I would recommend get a dog, go walking with it an hour. And in between, if you have time, go leisurely to float in the swimming pool. Okay, Martin, I think we're about out of time. In fact, we're about we <laughs> eight, eight, eight minutes over. <clears throat> so we got a little Q&A there. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It's very thought-provoking and uh, in many ways original and uh, uh, give everybody a lot to think about there with head trauma. So uh, we've recorded this and we'll post it on the New Mind YouTube channel.
anybody uh, wants to see it again, or if you know somebody who had missed it and wanted to see it. I think Rob is pretty much... Um, uh, I'm fully aware that this is out of the box, but uh, I hope that it might be helpful for some of you. Yeah. Are you going to send out your uh, PowerPoint, uh, Martin? Well, it would, you know, it would actually be a, a pretty library because uh, it's quite a lot of slides. I could produce it, but um, you can save it in a PDF file. I'm just suggesting that people may want it, so if you're willing to share it, just post it on the list or whatever. Yeah, I would. I, I would rather have people asking for it. If okay. You, if you don't, if you if you want it, please send me. You know, it's it's it's. Uh, I'm kind of shy because it's. Gotcha. It's, Really well sought over a book type of presentation here. It's more a discussion type of thing. Yep. But yes, I'll be glad to share it with you. Send me an email. You can get my email address by just clicking on my name on the on the uh, uh, presenters panel there. Just click on my name and copy the email address. All right. Thank oh. you. All righty. Richard, feel yeah. better. <laughs> yeah. Hope you feel better too, Rob. Everybody have a great evening. Bye. Yes, you guys uh, heal well.